Well, I'm here with Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. We are so delighted to have you at Oklahoma State University. Well, thanks. It's a delight to be here at this beautiful place. Well, you are uh, uh, you're currently back at Stanford, back right. home at Stanford. That's right, yes. And uh, tell, tell us what you're doing today. What well, I'm back at Stanford. I'm writing a couple of books, one about my family, another about the last eight years. I'm teaching. I'm uh, currently in the midst of our winter quarter, and I'm teaching an undergraduate, advanced undergraduate seminar uh, called Challenges and Dilemmas in U.S. Foreign Policy. Yeah, so plenty it's of those. great fun to do yeah, that. that. Yes. You don't lack for material. Right. Uh, well, life has changed a lot for you. Uh, do you like this better? I love this. Um, I loved my time in government. It is really a tremendous honor to serve this great country, to be Secretary of State. And my good friend George Schultz once told me that it's the best job in government. He's right. You get to go out and represent this great country. But uh, everybody needs a change. And eight years was a really long time. And I am first and foremost an academic. I love being back in the university. I love teaching again. I love following Stanford sports. Yeah. So it's it's great to be back. The schedule is grueling, I assume. Yes. It, it looks like yes. you're in an airplane. Ninety percent. You could have done that uh, that movie that's out now. Uh, right. Up in the air. Right up in the air. George Clooney, I spent yeah. a lot of time on airplanes. I think I I traveled something like like a million miles as secretary. But even with modern technology, you kind of have to be there. People expect you to come see them. It doesn't really work across a telephone or a video conference. Well, let's, let's uh, go back in time uh, to a, a young girl that grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, which at the time was a very different place than yes. it is today, certainly in terms of race relations. Yes. Uh, the site of one of Martin Luther King's most successful uh, uh, protests. Uh, how on earth? that a girl growing up in that environment end up uh, first at Stanford as a, as a professor and a provost and, and then uh, at the very seat of power for the world in yeah. Washington, D.C. Well, I always say when people ask me, how did you become who you are, I say, first of all, you start as a failed piano major. You can't plan <laughs> everything in life. Now you explain know? that. You did start at I the University of Denver. I started at the University of Denver as a piano major and a couple of years in realized that I was uh, headed for playing piano bar, not Carnegie <laughs> Hall, and decided to find something else, and I found international politics. But the most important part of that lesson was that I, I really understood, uh, have come to understand that you can't plan every stage of your life. Uh, you have to be open to uh, new directions. So it never occurred to you at all that no. you would uh, be no. interested in no. uh, Russia, for example? No, that, that came out of taking a class and loving what we were doing in the class, and then one thing led to another, and I became a Russianist, and then uh, met Brent Scowcroft, who was uh, National Security Advisor for President George H.W. Bush. How'd you meet him? I met him at a seminar at Stanford where, actually, I think I asked him a slightly rude question about something that he was doing, <laughs> and uh, we got to know each other. He thought I had promise. He became a real mentor to me. And so I then went on uh, from um, there to, uh, to get to know George W. Bush uh, to organize the foreign policy well, in yeah, this campaign. Yeah, but you don't normally meet somebody that's in government and this, then you meet the President of the United States. Well, I mean, how yes. did that happen? Well, I, I really did. I worked for George H.W. Bush for yeah, through, as, Scowcroft through Scowcroft, was, who was the, the National Security Advisor. I right. worked on the National Security Council. I, I then went back to Stanford. I'd been an, uh, a professor already for seven years, uh, eight years, when I went off to Washington. And um, I went back to Stanford. I was appointed provost of the university um, and did that job for six years. And then George H.W. Bush said, I want you to meet my son who's thinking of running for president. And uh, I spent some time with George W. Bush. So where was that? When was that? That was in 1990. Well, we first met in 95, but we met in 1998 then um, at, in, their in house at, at their house in Kennebunkport, Maine, the oh. house of the father in Kennebunkport, Maine. What did you think? I thought he was uh, really great. I, he was he was really fun to be around. He's a very different personality from his father. Different from his father, a real Texan. You could yeah. tell that he was a real Texan. Yeah. But uh, what really impressed me was uh, he wanted to talk about foreign policy, but he also wanted to talk about education. And he was uh, he'd done a lot to reform education in Texas. He had a phrase that I will never forget: the soft bigotry of low expectations said that we really had to make sure all of our children could read. And I found him a very attractive person. Uh, he'd been a good governor. And I organized his foreign policy. And that's how, when he won, I became national security advisor. But you know, back for a moment to that little girl in Birmingham, 
The other thing you have to know is you had to know my parents. Uh, John and Angelina Rice were extraordinary, ordinary people. And I'm writing a book about them by that title because uh, I would doubt that they ever made $60,000 between them. She, my mother was a teacher. My dad was a high school guidance counselor, minister, later a university administrator. But there was no educational opportunity that I was ever denied. And uh, they well, as a matter of fact, you graduated from college very young. I finished you? college very young. How did um, that happen? Just well, it was because I uh, skipped uh, a grade or two along the way. But um, I finished college uh, pretty young, went off to Notre Dame. 19. 19, 19 years old. Went off to Notre Dame, did my master's degree, uh, and then came back and eventually did a Ph.D. But uh, Again, never planning any particular step, just always trying to do what interested me. You know, in speaking to our students, uh, you, you made the point that e even in, in the environment you grew up in, in Birmingham, your parents convinced you that you really could be President of the United States. Yes. And uh, you darn near made it. You were <laughs> not very far down in succession, I don't think. I uh, the, uh, we now have an African American President of the United States. Are you, were you surprised? Did you, did you really believe it could happen? I, I thought it would happen. I thought I might be 80 when it did. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that it happened this quickly. Um, I was tremendously proud when uh, President Obama was elected because it said something about America mm -hmm. and about our ability to overcome uh, these long-held prejudices. Uh, that's pretty special. And, and it's interesting. You, you really don't hear uh, that he's a black president. No. No, in fact, it seems that, that we've become colorblind. Well, in fact, uh, we, we treat him just like we do every other president, yeah. very rudely and very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually kind of a good thing, yeah. you know, that uh, I don't think anybody uh, And is nobody really calls it being racist no, when no, no, they criticize. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's just a, a tough environment Washington is, and uh, that's what he's experiencing like every other president has experienced. Uh, I don't think we really are colorblind. If, if uh, somebody walks in a room, you see that they are African American. But what we are finally doing is we're getting to the point that it doesn't, you don't have preconceived notions of mm -hmm. that person when they walk into right. a room. And that's what's important. Uh, you might see that person and say, oh, maybe that person is a lawyer, or uh, maybe that person is uh, a university professor. And, and that's good because role identification and race are starting to finally uh, separate. Taking the eight years that you were in either National Security Advisor or Secretary of State, it, other than a war, on the wartime, it would be difficult to find, well, and I, in many respects we were in a war, yes, I guess, yes. but a more tumultuous period in, right. in U.S. history. Right. Uh, it, there had to be a tough, decisions five times a day, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm sure making the decision to go into Iraq was among Very the difficult. toughest, Very if not difficult. the toughest. Yes. Uh, but what were the really hard, uh, hard decisions that you had to make? And, uh, and, and give us a little window into yes. how all that happens. Well, you're right. The tough decisions came all the time. I think the, the first set of really tough decisions were immediately after September 11th because uh, if you were in a position of authority on September 11th, every day after was September 12th. And every day after, you got up and you read the terrorist threat report, and you were faced with uh, anthrax attacks and smallpox uh, scares, and you were trying to make decisions that would not make us a closed and fright frightened country, but would make us safer. And so there were just hard choices to make uh, every day. But by far the hardest decisions are decisions of war and peace. Uh, the hardest decisions are sending uh, men and women into harm's way. That's a, a very lonely decision for a president of the United States because ultimately he is mm -hmm. the only one who can do it. And those of us who are around presidents uh, do what we can to try and give advice and to give our opinions, but ultimately the president stands alone on that decision. Uh, you talked about optimism. Uh, a good deal, uh, and, the, and that, that nature, that very uh, nature of, of Americans. Uh, are you optimistic now about, given the state of the world and the, the, the new and, and uh, seemingly uh, unstoppable 
at least efforts uh, at terrorism? I am optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, through rose-colored glasses. It's going to take really hard work to make sure that we're not hit again. It's going to take really hard work to uh, make sure that we heal these failing states. That's, uh, it's, it's not easy, and we have to be patient. On our campus, and I'm sure campuses all over the United States, there's an outpouring of support for Haiti. Yes. Uh, which seems to be one of those failed states yes. and has been for many years. Yes. Right next door to the Dominican Republic. The successful which is, state, uh, yes. Yes, which yes. is hard to understand. Uh, is there any hope for Haiti after this body blow they've taken? Right. I, Haiti is one of the saddest places I've ever been. You know, I went to Port-au-Prince in uh, 2006, and uh, I've seen poverty and horrible poverty in a lot of places. I'd never really seen anything like Port-au-Prince. And um, I thought that Haiti was just beginning to crawl out. You know, they'd had an election. The uh, peacekeeping forces there, the UN peacekeeping forces, are actually doing a really good job in Haiti. Uh, we're doing a good job. Brazilian-led under UN auspices. Uh, we had all kinds of uh, programs for Haiti uh, where they could put their products, uh, their little textiles and so forth in duty-free into the United States. The world was focused on trying to help Haiti, and then this, this happens. And you almost feel that uh, this place just can't somehow ever get out. But we have to go back and we have to try again. It's the hope. It's, and we have to, we have to hope. But uh, they're, I, they're actually a pretty resilient people, and that's what we have to, have to pin our hopes on. You had some advice for our students, uh, which uh, many are watching or will be watching yes. this as well. Why don't you share yeah, that with yes. us again? Well, I'd say to, the, to your students uh, that it is extremely important to, to do a couple of things. First of all, find your passion. It might find you like mine found uh, me, and it might not be something, it might be something totally unexpected. Who would have thought I was going to be a Soviet specialist of all things? Secondly, uh, very important to try something hard. And I know it's very easy if you're good at numbers to stick with numbers and good at writing to stick with writing. But I learned my best lessons in life uh, from things that I succeeded in doing that I wasn't naturally good at doing. I think it's also really important, uh, and I have a prejudice here because I'm a professor of international politics, learn somebody else's language. And I really don't care if it's Spanish or Mandarin or Arabic or whatever. It is tremendously freeing and liberating to, to learn somebody else's language. You don't have to be fluent. You don't have to be fluent. It's just a great exercise to know a little bit about how other people speak. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, study abroad. And I know that uh, OSU has made a big push to make it possible for students to study abroad. And it doesn't matter if you don't want to be a specialist in international politics. I don't care if you want to be in engineer or go into agriculture or uh, if you want to be a, a doctor or a veterinarian, I don't care what you want to be. It, you will be tremendously enriched by going and seeing how other people live and living among them for a while. Is there any politics in your future? Oh, I think I'm going to do public service uh, for the rest of my life. I'm real involved in K-12 education, involved with the boys and girls clubs and extended learning, but uh, I, I'm really not somebody who wants to run for office. I had the, as I said, the best job in government. I don't think there's much that you can do for an encore, but there are lots of ways to serve this country and to serve the world, and I hope to find them. Well, I think you uh, exude uh, the, probably the most important advice you've given, and that's be optimistic. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you for your service, your service to our country, and thank you for coming to Oklahoma State University. Well, thank you for having me here, and uh, good luck to the Cowboys and everything Thanks. sports. Say go Pokes. Go Pokes. There you go. There you go. Okay, <laughs> great. Right. Thank you.